Irene pulled in at midnight Let on smoke and beer Proudly crawled to the porch and called Your favorite child is here Ma asked where you living And are you living right within Said with fire like a gospel choir, a saint immune to sin. Old Irene, like a raven bomb, she's cutting every rug and killing every judge she comes up on. Howdy there, Daylight Burners. Happy Wednesday. It is hump day already. Shit, we are blowing right through August, aren't we? Um, Got a really cool episode today. I think you're going to like it. A little something new. Uh, Right along the direct-to-consumer marketing deal. Uh, Got a fella out of, well, basically Portland, Oregon. Runs a mobile slaughterhouse, basically. And it's a cool episode. I think you're going to like it. I enjoyed the shit out of it. Uh, But speaking of direct to consumer, I got some bills to pay. And first up, we got Stetson Ranches, my good buddy Jesse and and his buddy or and his family, his dad Jay and Tina, his his mom and Krista running a multi-generational ranch up there in Fromberg, Montana, raising industrial hemp badass quarter horses and the finest beef that money can buy all there between the priors and the bear tooths just putting out excellent product all the time and proud sponsor of this show so industrial hemp they're ahead of the game it's going to be a cash crop one of these days uh one of these days we're here real soon and uh they're getting uh, getting in the game ahead of time i got some really cool stuff lined up with that um, but they're also, they're a diver, diversified ranch. You have to be, and they're, they're very forward thinking. Uh, but they're also sticking true to uh, tradition and that is where their horses come into play. They got some of the best brood mares you're going to find, uh, some of the best bloodlines you're going to find as far as foundation quarter horses go. And, uh, some just really just big old booty mares with uh, a lot of bone, a lot of athleticism, Throwing out some really nice colts uh, from really good studs. Um, Tina's really got a, a good program out there and uh, some some really fine horse flesh. And the cornerstone of the whole operation is the direct consumer uh, uh, packaged beef, box beef. I don't know how, uh, what the proper way to call it. But basically, you got an F1 black baldy calf coming to your plate. Uh, however you want it, cut and wrap to your uh, preference. And it's going to be a guaranteed prime carcass. Uh, all the meat that uh, comes in the package comes to you for six ninety five a pound. Now, that's about the same price as a package of hamburger in the grocery store. Well, you're going to get a package of hamburger, plenty of packages of hamburger off of your steer. Um, and it's all coming from one animal, not like five to 600 animals like you'd see in, uh, in the beef you get in the grocery store, but you're also getting steaks, you're getting roasts, you're getting all the good shit plus the hamburger for six ninety five a pound, which is about the price of hamburger in the stores right now. Uh, you, you know, the people and, and you know how they raise their, their cattle. They're, you know, they're on the, the same place their whole life. They are pasture raised, grain finished, and just an excellent product coming straight to your doorstep. Farm to table, pasture to table, ranch to table, however the fuck you want to call it. Stetson Ranches is doing it right. You got any questions? Give me a holler over at the Facebook page. Shoot me a message and uh, about any of the stuff, and we'll we'll get you set up. And next up, we have got Loma Livestock. You know George. You love George. No reason not to love George because he's a great guy and he's running the best goddamn sale barn in North America right there in Loma, Colorado at 1369 12 and a half road. 
They're doing it upright every Friday, moving into the fall run season, uh, 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, make sure you get over there, watch a sale, sell, sell some cattle, buy some cattle, whatever you got to do. If you can't make it, uh, well, kind of a loser, but it's all right. You can make it up because you can watch it all online. Go to dvauction.com, click on the Loma Livestock tab. You can watch the sale live right there and you can bid live right there. It's a great thing. George has got a lot of good stuff going on uh, technology-wise. It's going to add some value to your bottom line. And uh, he's just doing it right. Another forward-thinking guy. We've got the best sponsors in the world. Uh, they help uh, put together this whole studio, all the, the cool shit that I get to do and all the cool shit that uh, I've bought to make a better product for you guys. It's all because of uh, folks like like Jesse and George, and I appreciate the shit out of them. So, uh, thanks guys for uh, continuing to put up with this nonsense. Now, let's talk about putting your meat in your hands and stroking it. Not really. I just had to throw a dick joke in there, but we're going to talk about meat. Big meat. Huge meat. Marvelous meat. Uh, we got Andrew Turner from... Uh, I'm not sure what town. Anyway, up there in Oregon, teaching you all about the meats. I, uh, the first one of these I did, I just recorded on the, on my, uh, while I was writing pins on, I just had my phone and head <laughs> and earbuds in and that's how I recorded it. And that's awesome. It, it didn't turn out too bad. So I did a whole bunch of them like that, but it, it just, after a while, I think the novelty wears off of hearing cattle in the background and, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it's just, it's a pain to edit later on. So, uh, yeah, now I, I've got this little kind of studio space now. So it's, it's pretty cool. You got to get a Ram mount for your saddle arm, you know? I like know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get like the little, uh, the foam, uh, the foam soundproofing deal that sits exactly. out in front. <laughs> I, don't, I can't see a fucking thing where I'm going, but <laughs> there we are. <laughs> but uh, well, folks, I've got a I've got a fellow from uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon. He uh, he took the night of protesting off so we could talk about uh, farm to table uh, meat consumption. Uh, a fellow named Andrew mm -hmm. Turner uh, is known as uh, at Farm Butcher on Instagram. Uh, if you don't follow him, you should. Uh, it's a really cool, really informative page. And uh, and uh, other than that, I don't know much about you, buddy, but uh, I like your page and uh, it fits a lot of, right into the some of the stuff I've been kind of pounding the table for that us on the agricultural end of the spectrum kind to kind of need to get on board with like kind of how the market's changing and whatnot. But I uh I guess so you you have a, a mobile slaughterhouse that you uh that you that you operate. So I guess just introduce yourself and uh and let's uh a little bit about your outfit because I, I like I like I'm I'm excited to hear about it, so I'll shut up. No, that's all right. Yeah, so I purposefully try to keep it a little bit dark on the social media just because I've dealt with a bit of the flack from uh anti-animal agriculture folk before mm -hmm. we can get into that a little later but yeah so i'm i run a mobile slaughter service custom exempt in uh just outside of portland and all my customers are um for the most part i would say they're doing it for tax reasons so a lot of people raising animals like on their small two, three, four acre parcels. Oh, okay. Um, and then they get their farm tax deferral or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, and then they get their own freezer filled for, you know, break even cost. Mm. Um, they're not making a ton of money on it. If maybe just a little bit. Um, but that's kind of the cool thing about this side of Oregon too, is it's so lush and green and temperate that, um, you know, unless you're really pushing your ground, you don't have to supplement a lot of feed. And I'll, I'm talking mostly cattle, pigs and sheep are less of my business. 
Um, okay. Pigs, like sheep the least and pigs probably second, but um, yeah. So you can run on a two acre patch of good ground with good grass. You don't might only have to hay two months out of the year if that. Um, so yeah, a lot of them are just doing it for the tax reasons and I provide just the slaughter service. So for those un- unfamiliar, I'm just basically going out and butchering these animals that are for uh, the, the owners. So that could be someone who owns a quarter or owns a half or owns a whole. Mm. Um, and then I take it back to the, the cut and wrap facility and they cut it up there. I just deal with the, the farm slaughter side of things. And that's, that's the way I like it. Truth be told. You yeah. do all the, all the dirty work for them and, uh, Totally. Hell yeah. So, um, so you just, you take like a reefer truck out there and you got a bunch of winches and stuff. Do you use captive bolt or do you use like a 22? So, uh, it's just, all it really is is a stainless steel box with a winch on the back. There's no refrigeration or anything like that. Um, okay. It's cool enough here pretty much all year. We start early and then this time of year, I, I have to be back at the shop by like one thirty or two. Okay. Um, and for most people, like I started under federal inspection, doing federal inspected slaughter where it's all refrigerated, like almost the whole time. Yeah. And it kind of freaked me out. But if you think about like how people do their game animals, deer and elk, like they're not going straight into a cooler. You just have to get it cold within 24 hours all the way to the bone. Yeah. Um, and like on a big fed steer, like market steer or whatever, which truthfully I don't see much of, um, that can be tricky. So we try to schedule that out mm. for end of the day. So it goes right in the truck and back to the cooler. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I use my captive bolt gun that was gifted to me from a customer for the second time uh this year and i've been in business for almost 10 years oh shit yeah Yeah. so everything else is 22 mag 223 243 if they're real naughty yeah Uh, (laughs) yeah so and every day is different i've got some customers that um i'll show up and they'll have four to six in a pen and we just walk up drop all six get to work uh or some like like yes well, a lot lately, but they're like third they're out there. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's handy. <laughs> yeah. So you're like, are there any distinctive features? Like the only steer. <laughs> oh, all right. That, so, that, that that's well, that's just real handy of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just look at looking for dicks through my scope, and <laughs> just, <laughs> once I see one, I know that's my guy. Yeah. Just, just scanning for cock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> that's funny. Um, so <clears throat> what's the, the typical, like, what do you, what do you do with, uh, when you gut it and everything? Do you have, a do you have to take that somewhere or do they, you just like spare it or what? Yeah. So typical day for me, we leave the, I park at the shop that I deliver to. Um, and then we'll leave there at like anywhere from five thirty to six in the morning, depending on how far we have to go for our first stop. And we could have anywhere from one stop to five stops in the day. And the animals just being like the old McDonald's farm, yeah, you know, like a little bit of everything. Um, show up to the first farm, get however many animals that were there for dead bleeding out winch them to the truck. Uh, I have a helper that comes with me. He's almost full time now, but, um, and so we'll both get to work doing groundwork, which is just like leg removal, just like prep work till you can Mm -hmm. hang them up. Okay. Um, And then everything except for sheep, we'll start skinning them out on the ground, lock them up. So they're nice and all the same. Uh, skin them out like that, hang them up on the winch, do a little more like technical prep work. And then the insides, like all the guts from beef, um, you know, like a average size beef gut can fill a 55 gallon barrel. Yeah. Um, 
So we'll empty the rumen on farm and okay. just leave that big pile of grass, depend, <laughs> depending on if they fed them the night before or that morning or when we showed up, uh, determines that, that size. And then, yeah, load that into just a barrel and then it goes in the front of the truck. Okay. And uh, that gets picked up by a renderer, which I've heard about. He's told me where it goes, but I, I know it goes on a train car somewhere huh. <laughs> that's, that's all i know about that <laughs> some some sausage plant i think it's like for mostly animal feed yeah i imagine yeah. it is i i know uh there's there's a couple feed yards that will uh that that will refeed the pond off of the from uh from one of the big tyson plants they'll just uh all that room and fluid they'll just recycle really? it yeah it's really? awful smelling stuff but you know it's uh it makes sense. It's in the it's in the room, and so it's not digested. And uh, well, and I've heard of like people with sick cattle like needing um, like that rumen fluid, and like you're supposed to give it to them like it's apple cider vinegar or whatnot, and it like cures them. So I wonder if there's huh. something there. I wonder. I I don't, I don't guess I've heard that one before, but that's interesting. Um, so so do you do <clears throat> just mostly? Uh, just beef and, and hogs and, and lamb. Like, do you do chickens and stuff or? No poultry. <coughs> uh, beef, pork, lamb. I used to do a ton of alpaca. Really? Um, oh, yeah. That was like my bread and butter for like two and a half years. Was, really? I was, the al- I was the alpaca guy. <laughs> uh, I We were talking about this the other day. I forget who I was talking about it with, but. I've never ate alpaca. I've never heard of anybody eating alpaca, but I assumed somebody had at some point because I was, uh, yeah. I was li- listening to a book on uh, like the Arizona Indian Wars fighting the Apache today. And those Apache, like they would eat beef and goats and sheep and, and whatnot, but like their favorite was mule and mule burrow and horse. Like that, that's what they, and they weren't really hor- a horse tribe. They, they preferred to just move around on foot. So if they were stealing horses, it was strictly to eat them. But I've never heard of, yeah, I've never heard of anybody eating the alpaca, but have you tried it? Oh, yeah. So the people are always like talking to me about alpacas and llamas. And I'll always tell them like alpacas just like eating like black tail deer or hmm. super lean beef. Usually we just grind it. Yeah. And make burger out of it. I fed it to folks and they had no idea. Like it wasn't ground beef. It's it pound for pound, the same thing. Uh, but llama tastes like greasy old state fair corn dogs. Oh, and it's <laughs> gross. <laughs> I bet. I bet. That's, uh... I don't know what the difference is, but it's nasty. So was there just a bunch of people like with old llamas that need to put down or like, were they, they breeders or, or what? That's actually kind of interesting. So here, especially in the the Pacific Northwest, in like the late 90s, there was a huge alpaca industry, right? When like the tech industry took off. Oh, okay. These, like tech folks started buying up big swaths of land. Um, and they're like, well, we don't want cows. Like, and so they just bought a ton of alpaca and like started showing alpacas and for their fleece. And then mid two thousands, the like the bottom fell out of that market. So there were all these like high dollar alpacas that were worth nothing. Huh. Uh, so they get old, and then what do you do with them? Yeah. And so people were getting them for these customers that I was doing them for was were getting them for free. And then it's also a non amenable, so okay. you can you can slaughter it custom and sell it per pound retail. Really. Yeah. Huh. Um, like there's there's some gray areas there, but yeah, so like some of the stuff I would slaughter would end up being sold on farm like as one pound packages as opposed to like a quarter or a half. Huh. What's yeah. the ribeye like on a on an alpaca? Uh think about like a the leanest deer if you've ever seen like a deer skinned out. Yeah. Leanest deer you've ever skinned. And then like a neck that long, <laughs> that, that it just like makes a big U 
when you cut the head off because there's that big tendon there that holds the head up when they're alive. Uh-huh. So when they're dead it, and you hang them by the hind legs, they're like this and you cut that head off and it goes, huh. that's yeah, wild. They're, they're strange, super strange. And the, have you ever heard the noises they make? Yeah. Yeah. Like dinosaur noises. Yeah, pretty well. And, and they're, they're a rumen animal, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yes. I, but they're camelid. So like okay. camel family, I think. I think. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how that works, but I, I think they, they got a ruminant digestive system. So yeah, they've got a big paunch. Yeah. Um, I just don't know much about them. I'm not, they're woolly. And if you've never heard two alpacas or two llamas fighting, that's something you need to look up on YouTube because all they try to do is bite each other's testicles off. Really? That's, that's what they do. I mean, that, that's how you know they're serious, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Breeding I, rights, apparently. I, shit, I, I suppose so. They, uh, that's, that's wild. Well, and I, I, they got the neck. They could, they could probably reach around there. It's, uh, huh. I guess. So, that, yeah, alpacas were a weird one that I've done a lot of. I still do yak every once in a while. Really? That's some yeah. greasy shit, ain't it? It's just tough. It's like skinning. It's like working on an elk with hair that's really long and tough. And they're wild. They, yeah, they're a wild animal. They don't, they chuff. Huh. They make really weird noises. Um, and then the odd buffalo here and there. But I, uh, same kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, that the hide on a buffalo is, God, that stuff is thick. It's and just like, so that's the same thing as a yak, too. I, I would imagine. I had a pair of custom boots that were uh, water buffalo, and that, that stuff was, I mean, they got pretty hot in the summer, but that stuff was so thick. It, I mean, it was almost, oh, almost indestructible. It was, it was wild stuff. But, yeah, I, I had a, uh, a friend of mine. He was part of, I forget, there's a Blackfoot or Crow, uh, but he's one uh he's a member of the tribe up in montana uh up by great falls and he drew a buffalo tag here last year i think year before last maybe and uh i traded him some some mule deer kansas mule deer meat for uh montana grass-fed buffalo uh <laughs> he got the better end of that deal uh hands down yeah. that uh yeah yeah, if you if you're uh, shooting a, a mule deer or or, or a whitetail in the the western half of Kansas, that thing has been eating nothing but just grain crops and alfalfa his whole life. So you might as well be eating <laughs> just really lean beef. Uh, yeah, or like uh, like good lamb. Like yeah, you might have a little flavor to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and then I had uh, I had one of those buffalo steaks and uh, and I cooked it pretty rare you know just just seared it uh good and hot on both sides and that was it and it was still like flavor was fine i suppose but it was just like chewing shoe leather uh, yeah like cutting it against the grain you know every bite made sure to cut it you know against the grain try to get it you know tender as i possibly could and it was still just man it was tough same but, so like with buffalo and yak every time we work on them i'll like i get my knives pretty sharp every morning and i'll go out there and it's just like i haven't even like i've been dragging them on the concrete and i always fight them and then go to the next stop and it could be like a nice fed steer or pig and it's like oh no they're sharp they're just wickedly tough animals huh that's yeah. crazy what's yeah. uh what's your process on sharpening your knives like so what kind of you use like the the packing house steels so I'll use a steel during the day to just kind of keep the edge up. And the mm-hmm. one I use, like I have in some of the pictures, you can see I have it on my belt. Um, and all it really is, is just like, there's no coarseness to it. It's just a piece of magnetized steel. Okay. Um, it's smooth. But in the morning I use one of those like little belt sharpeners um, and just go over my knives with that, depending on how bad I was to them the day before, how many teeth I hit with them. Yeah, <laughs> I today go ahead. I say I, you know, I it depends on on the time of year and how you know how shitty the cattle are that we get. But I uh, I necropsy you know 
probably eight, eight out of 10 of the ones that we have if, when they die. And we don't, I mean, it's been like a week since we've had a dead. So it's, you know, not a whole lot, but I worked at a big right. feed yard where we were, uh, you know, I think I, I posted 23 of them in a day one time. That was a, that was the biggest <laughs> day I've had. That, that was a lot of work. Uh, boy, if you don't touch your knives up, like in between, like even like mid steer, like that, by the time you get three or four of them done, like that thing is like, you might, like you might as well use it as a club at that point. Cause there's no, no yeah. edge. It's like painful. Yeah. Yeah. It's especially like you get, uh, some of the bigger cattle where the, the joints have started to calcify a little bit, uh, on the ribs. Yeah. Holy shit. Like you're, you're better off with just tree trimmers at that point. Totally. And like the old cows I found, we had some, uh, I posted the heads on my story, but the, those long horns that we yeah. did, they like, they hang at like 300 pounds, but they're horn they're all horns. Yeah. Uh, and they're just like trying to skin cardboard. Like, Oh, I bet. Just, yeah. It, not a lot of fun to work on, but. Still yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. They, those, uh, those long horns, they, they look impressive and, Till you see the shoulders back and then they're just it's just nothing but frame. Yeah, Longhorn, Coriani, and Highland, like I could leave them. I, I've never seen a Highland uh all all skinned out, so I, I'd imagine there's there's not much there either, huh? Uh you ever seen a jersey? <laughs> mm, not seen hanging. Holstein. Yeah, I've seen I've seen no, a whole stain hanging. Uh, we've got a, a few jerseys, but I like I've never I've never seen one uh hanging though. So uh but I, I've For seen the a, most part they look like a dairy a dairy okay. cross. Okay. Yeah, I've uh I, I've seen one one longhorn steer that they, they finished out, you know, to actual finish weight. And uh and he was he was still super lean. But I mean, you know, he had like about a two inch fat cap, but like nothing in the muscle. I mean, it, it was, Dang. yeah. I mean, he had a, he had a lot of back fat, but there was nothing in the, in the muscle. There was no marbling at all. That's one thing I wish I could convey to my customers. Cause you got to think any given day I'm dealing with anyone where from like one to five people that I might see once a year, twice a yeah. year. And they're, this is like their animal crop for the yeah. year. Um, and a lot of them are like, Oh, I'll talk to them. I'm like, yeah, I got some Angus come out there and I'll go out there and see them. And like, those are Angus crossed with Jersey. Like, yeah, there's a bit, there's a big difference. Oh um, yeah. And people be like, they're dual purpose. I'm like, yeah, kind of. Yeah, but no, <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be bad. But it's not going to be like what you think you're getting. <laughs> no, and like a uh, Holstein eats really good if you spend the time and money to actually feed them out. It, but it takes oh, really a is. while. But they marble really good. They're just a pain in the dick because they're massive by that point. I mean, they're you're like. 15, 1600 pounds. If you don't get one, one of like the good Holsteins that have, have more of a fat face than, than the rest of them, those feed out pretty good. But the ones with the great big long face, it's just nothing but hip bones and hide. Well, yeah. Cause you got to think they bred them to be high up off the ground mm -hmm. and all that energy they're eating is not going into meat production. No, it's the going straight part. to them, to the mammaries. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and they just they they don't. I mean, they they marble eventually, and they've got it. They've got the the yeah. The dairy guys are are on the ball with their, you know, their genetics. Uh, I mean, they they got way behind the ball on their bulls because they they've only bred for cow disposition. The bull didn't. They didn't really give a shit. And next thing right. you know, the, the bulls are just awful to deal with. I Dangerous. Mean, yeah, and uh, and the the cows are just dumber than shit and uh so it seems like they've made a little bit more move to introduce some some newer genetics but then they figured out hey if you just cross them with a, a beef cow uh, or beef bull then 
you know, you don't even have to worry about changing the Holstein genetics. You just, right. you just get a little bit of marbling with uh, with it. And those, uh, you see a ton of those uh, those Angus Holstein crosses being stud nowadays. And and it, probably not quite half the time it takes them to feed out, but probably knock a like a solid third of the the, right. the days on feed out, and and they still marble really well. Um, but they, uh, I got, what, what's the outside the yaks and, the you know, the longhorns, what's, what's the worst to, to, uh, to deal with either any species. Uh, boars and sows. I had, uh, <laughs> I got bit. You, have you ever heard of American Guinea hog? No. I, I so, know virtually nothing about the hog industry, so the, you might as well just keep it that way because it's <laughs> in pigs. Um, American guinea hogs—they're kind of like a pot belly pig, but they're not a pot belly pig because they're not pets. But they're like fully finished and like finished out and fat, like with an inch and a half of fat over their back. They're like one fifty alive. Oh, okay, um, they're tiny. So like the whole hanging thing is like, you know, two and a half feet long. Um, but they're easier on pasture if because that's a big thing up here is pasture raised pasture pigs. Pasture raised pigs, yeah. Yeah. So mud fields. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I mean there's people that do it right, but mud fields is pretty common too. Yeah. Yeah. I so can imagine. They're just little things, but this customer of mine had this American guinea hog boar that she wanted me to come out and kill. And the guinea hogs are generally like really sweet temperament. Like they're, you know, like you can get in with them. They're not wild. They're pretty friendly. They're just like, you can scratch them like a dog. Yeah. She had this boar and he was probably 300 pounds like live. So for a guinea hog, pretty good. Pretty size. big size. Yeah. Yeah. For like, that's your standard market hog for the most part. Like, yeah. Like 250 to 300 is what you're shooting for there. Isn't it? Totally. So he was about, you know, card table long and half a card table wide. Okay. <laughs> Just a little brick. And I walked and they didn't clip his teeth. So in pigs, they grow these bottom teeth that are the mm. tusks. And when they're piglets, they'll usually clip them so they don't get into fights and stuff like that. Well, they'd never clipped his teeth. And so they continue to grow up, up through the top of their mouth. That's why you'll see like, wild pigs and stuff have those weird wrinkles on the top lip. Yeah. Because the tusks come out and there's another set of teeth up there that are the sharpening teeth. So when they close their mouth, they self file that tooth down and it's flat. Okay. Huh. But that flat edge on the edge of it is just like obsidian. It's razor sharp ivory, wow. essentially. Um, so anyhow, this big boy was in his pen and I went up and I was scratching on him and uh, he was eating sunflower seeds and plenty happy. And I walked around to his side and he thought I was coming for his sunflower seeds and just whack that quick. And I had a boar tusk go inch and a half into my thigh. Oh, shit. And, yeah, I just started bleeding. And four, it was only four stitches, but the Q-tip that she took it to clean that wound out was in there <laughs> Long ways. Holy shit. I bet that hurt like a motherfucker. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was not great. But how yeah, far from your uh, femoral artery? <laughs> For what? How far from the artery was it? Uh, no, I think it was a little ways off, but oh, okay. I didn't really care to ask the lady. Yeah. Uh, no, don't even want to know. It, it wasn't even that, like, it didn't hurt that bad. It just bled a lot. Yeah. I cleaned it out with, um, what was that, betadine? Oh but yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Good and stuff. Scrubbed it and didn't need any shots or anything. They just stitched it up and said it was good. And no problem since just a sweet I had, scar. I had the same type of deal, except it wasn't, it was all my, my own fault. I was cutting an abscess in the, it was one, it was right on like the elbow. Uh -huh. uh, and the way our shoot is set up, like there is, you have to back them out of the head catch and just, and try to squeeze them real hard, but it's a, it's, it's an old wore out silencer, you know? And so once those, those cylinders wear out, you know, they can just, you know, yes. they, they can flex and kind of push that, that squeeze out the bottom squeeze. 
So I didn't want to run him through the chute. Well, I just roped him in the pin and tied him down. And, uh, and uh, as I was tying him down, uh, I, I stuck the, the scalpel in my back pocket. And, uh, and then I, I, I made this, the slice and then he kicked. So I went to, to make another wrap on the, on the tie rope, put it back in my pocket. And then I, I sat back, I didn't have the cap on it. And I shoved that thing. Yeah. Probably, probably a solid inch into my ass cheek. And I was, it was like, it was like a real burning sensation right off the bat. And that was it. And then, uh, but yeah, I, I stuck it through a pair of jeans through my boxers. Uh, I think I still got the pair of boxers. They 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 were pretty gnarly. Like it <laughs> soaked all the way down my leg. Like I had I had caked blood at the bend of my knee by the time it all it was all said and done. Nice. It, was, nice. it was it was it was pretty gnarly. Uh, well, it wasn't as cool a story as as yours, but uh, it it bled probably my just as much. Was in there in shorts, so <laughs> his shorts and rubber boots, and he got me right on the back of the shorts. And I'm stupid. That's funny. I guess being a, a mobile slaughter guy, like as long as you're there to to show up and, and kill an animal and, and put it in the, somebody's freezer, they don't give a shit what you're wearing. You could probably wear like the Borat swimsuit and then... And be, Pretty much. Like, I mean, I guess in, in Portland, you they probably wouldn't even look twice at you. I mean, I used to like just wear, uh, you know, those like... Uh, what do they call the like athletic shirts? And yeah. I just like cut the sleeves off of them for summertime mm-hmm. and be in like khaki shorts and boots. And I just don't really give a shit. <laughs> um, I'm not there to be to look cool. I'm trying to be comfortable, do my work. Um, well, that's uh, that's kind of one of those things. Like I, I just I, I was looking at your bio and just said uh, mobile slaughterman. I was like. Well, that's pretty handy. Like that was the first thing that I was like, that, that's a, that's a good service. Like, and then I, I was, it crossed my mind today. And then you, when you said something that kind of brought it back up. Yeah. Like nobody really gives a shit as long as you, that you get that animal out of their way and uh, get it in a, in at the packing house that they, they probably just don't give a shit. Totally. Well, I'm like, so I'm friends with a group of guys, like, you know, pen pal internet friends. Yeah, There's a group of guys that are uh, mobile slaughter guys all over. So nice. Australia, New Zealand, Southern California, and on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, all over. And they're like, you know, they're the kind of guys that really care about their job, and like are yeah. passionate about it. But a lot of like the local mobile slaughter uh, options <laughs> are <laughs> there. There's a special breed of people. A bunch um, of babas. Yeah, and like I've de- I've met a bunch of them that are just like drug into drugs. Like meth mm. is a big one because yeah, the more meth you do, the more cows you can kill. So wow, might as yeah. well. <laughs> uh, and these days aren't easy. So yeah, um, so as long as you're like not on meth, show up on time, and like halfway personable. You probably figure this job out, but don't. Well, I don't want to tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> what percentage of these uh, these meth addicts that 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 run mobile slaughterhouses? What percentage of them do you think were bull haulers at one point? <laughs> <laughs> I know one guy. Definitely <coughs> off seasons driving truck. He doesn't say what he's hauling, but yeah. Uh, he's, he's a pretty good dude though. Um, yeah, like just some of the rigs you like, I can see on the road, they're just like all rusted out and like <laughs> parts and pieces flying just everywhere. Please, like, how do you get away with that? Please look at me. Please, <laughs> please draw your attention over here. I know we got the, the company logo on the side of the truck a couple of years ago. And I was like, I don't, I don't like this at all. Like, <laughs> I was good with white box truck. Yeah. That's, that's pretty genius. It's uh, well, it's like what all the, you know, like the undercover cops and stuff would drive is just something unassuming that you see all the time. And so yours is like basically just a beer truck, right? With, totally. Without, without well, the refrigeration. If you know what you're looking for, you can spot them. You yeah. see a box truck with a winch on the back. 
Yeah. That's mobile slaughter truck. Um, the, I was, I didn't have the logo on it at one point and I was going through a small town and this guy pulls up to me and like, it was like a Buick that was all like B take shit. And he's <laughs> like, rolls down his window. He's like, you're a mobile slaughter service. And I was like, yep. And he's like, my dad did that. Thanks. I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is what it is. We do. So that's the other thing is the, like the variety of customers I deal with is insane. I bet. So up in, if most people don't know Portland, unless you're from here, but there's this area called the West Hills and this road that divides the West Hills from like the suburbs from the city called skyline. And it's like where the trailblazers have houses and. Oh, like, Okay. <clears throat> yeah it's like the nicest nicest big houses with the best view it's where like would, all all nine of the the black people in portland live <laughs> <laughs> no no comment from uh from the mobile butcher man <laughs> this, this guy's got to keep busy <laughs> yeah that's true I, I i can piss off who i want uh you can't so anyhow right. that that's a joke about how uh all these Black Lives Matter protests are, are, well, riots have been going on for 90 days in Portland, and there's like nine black people that live in Portland. Maybe 10. Maybe 10. Eight more. Yeah. They've all, they've all been pushed out. Yeah. Um, don't get me started on that. <laughs> I, I was really considering making a tinfoil hat and like having it ready to go. Oh, perfect. Put on. Ah, I love. I love <laughs> Mason conspiracies. <laughs> um, yeah. So the oh Skyline Boulevard. Yes. So I got a call for this person up there, and I went up and I pull in the address, and it's like mansion house. The gr- the driveway is like hand set pavers in a mosaic. Oh, and like. Out in the back is this Jersey cow, <laughs> like, <laughs> this milking cow, and I am like that. I don't know. And the lady comes out, and I think she was Korean. Don't. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, her and her husband were doctors. They all at, look the, at the same. It's the, okay. <laughs> her husband were doctors at the teaching hospital in town. And uh, they had this Jersey cow that they didn't want to milk anymore. And so I butchered her on that mosaic tile driveway and she was ecstatic about it. She thought that was so cool. And it was just everything from that all the way down to like giant hogs being fed like food scraps out the kitchen window in a mud hole. And I have to back my truck through piles of trash and everything in between. So uh, that's wild. It's pretty wild. That's like, wild. I've got a couple of customers um up that are like right next to Phil Knight's house, the guy that CEO of Nike and like oh, okay. stuff like that that you're like, I don't want to look anywhere, I don't want to touch anything because yeah, dear God, let me not miss. <laughs> yeah, no shit, because uh <laughs> you know there's cameras everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So uh yeah, being Portland, Portland is making a run for the most liberal shithole city in the country. Like they're they're making a pretty good case for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you could put them right up there with like San Francisco, L.A., New York. Uh, they're they're up right along the same same lines. So I'm sure you get your share of vegan activists or animal rights people. That uh, how, how much of an issue is that for you? <laughs> It was funny that, like, my first year of business, before I had done any, like, logos, anything like that, I was just getting up and rolling, and they just searched some things and found where my truck was and put bleach in the diesel tank, and we got a call from the FBI asking us how the truck was running. And we said, uh, fine. Like for back then, it was this old clapped out 
uh, oil valve Cummins that was like running like shit anyhow. So no, you put dump bacon grease down that though, and it'll do just fine. Yeah. So we're like, okay. And then we got a call like four or five days later from the sheriff. And, uh, he was like, you guys need to check your diesel tanks. And I dipped them. And I was like, that's, that's not just diesel. Um, something's in there. And all the inside was rusted out. That was really about it. I used to get some hate on Instagram, but I think Instagram kind of figured an algorithm out, but I yeah. hadn't dealt with anything. Uh, which has been awesome. So, cause that's I cool. Leave it public and everything like that. So, yeah, I, I noticed like there, it's like one out of five of your videos gets covered up. It yeah. seems like, but, uh, it's a weird, it's a weird thing being the, in the ag business, uh, on totally. social, on social media, like when they, they just want to censor everything, but people get so sensitive about animals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had a uh, I had an abscess video got blocked off of uh, TikTok of all places the other day. Like it, really? it's it stayed up on on YouTube and Facebook, and it it didn't even get covered up. But uh, but TikTok wouldn't even let me post it. Hmm. And yeah, and I don't TikTok's got a great algorithm because it's it's a lot of stupid shit until like it figures out what you're what you're watching and then like my my news feed's awesome on that like it's That's just cool. nothing yeah just nothing but hilarious shit uh and it's kind of just wide like, open yeah there's everything on there i'm like two weeks into the tiktok rabbit hole uh my girlfriend got me on it and i was like T- i'm not like 13 and she was like just do this and i started finding it. i was like oh this is all about like diesels and cows this is awesome yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I've got like a bunch of comedians and, uh, and a bunch of cowboys and that that's, and guns. Like that's sure. like, there's, there's all sure. that. And, uh, I don't know, like, and then there's the, like the big argument of whether China's stealing all of our data. Well, of course they are. It, but so is Google and Problem. so, so is Facebook and, and so is the government, by the way. So, um, I don't know. I just, I, I don't heard. Yeah. China's gonna get it one way or the other. I, I at that point, I I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I just I, I think it's I, I like it because they're for the most part. It seems like they're pretty strongly free speech, and I uh, I like that that aspect because I mean that I see a whole bunch of liberal hippie bullshit on there. I see a whole bunch of uh, super super Trump conservative shit, and and then a whole lot of other stuff in between. That's none of it. It's just. Just right. funny stuff or cool shit, and I don't know. That it's it seems like it was it's kind of like Twitter was back in the day before everybody got really uh, angry about everything on Twitter. But um, yeah, but that was only the only uh, only platform that that censored my, that my abscess video, um, which was surprising. I figured it would have been Facebook first, and then like. Two months from now, right. it'd be Instagram will, will uh, be like, oh, wait, that's not cool. But Or just uh, like put the, the cover on it, which yeah. I always find is funny that they don't show it. Like when I look at my own profile, it doesn't show which ones are covered. Which really? I don't, I don't care, but it'd just be nice to know. Yeah. You know, like what are they after? I, I know have they, to say though, go ahead. Uh, I know they censored the one of uh, of your lamb heads the other day. They uh, they covered that one up, which understandable. <laughs> it, it's not a it's not a picture for the the faint of heart, but it's also it's yeah. it is what it is. The one that I always like find interesting is I'll get people commenting on stuff like the world needs to see this, like everybody needs to see this. <laughs> Like, yeah, but they don't need to be surprised by it. Um, no. Because that doesn't do us that doesn't do us any favors. Now I, I, I view that same way I view the open carry activists. Like, yeah, you oh, have yeah. A, a right to do that. Yes, you do. But should you? Probably not. Yeah. You're not helping your cause by just open carrying an AR to a random rally. Like you're you're just scaring people at that point. And if that's if that's what you're trying to go for, 
That's fine, but you're also not furthering the cause for open carry. The same way oh. by just like if you don't put some sort of caption or something. Like I, I'm okay with uh, like the covering up of say like this should be or this is sensitive material. But then of course, like every every left wing thing that starts out with good intentions, it gets taken to the extreme oh. where like you just have. You know, somebody saying uh, abortion is murder or something like that, then they like cancel block it. Block it out. Yeah, block it out, or they'll say false information or something. And so it, it's like, it's all those, you know, most of those left wing deals start out with good intentions and like a pretty decent proposal behind it. And then they get, you know, just blown way out, like right. all the way to left field. Yeah. Um, I try to feel like whenever I'm doing stuff, because like on the on Instagram, that's the only place I put my work stuff. I try not to put too much personal stuff on there, but uh, I try to do stuff to like further the industry as a whole. Yeah. And that's got to be like everything from like the small producer that maybe has two a year to the guys like I've got some people scheduled here this week that they're doing 50 hogs this year and like 20 some beef, which for a one organization is pretty that's, good. That's a, uh, that's a lot of meat being, yeah, uh, and, that, and that's being, all custom. Like, yeah. They're, they're dealing with those people and we're just acting as the service in between. And I'm um, guessing they've got really high quality animals because otherwise they wouldn't be, they wouldn't, or at least they have decent quality because otherwise they wouldn't have the volume that they're, they're putting out. Right. So there's like, I try to give people, I get all pissy and grumpy and like, uh, big egg, I guess like educated, uh, that's not the right word, like conventionally um, yeah, kind of grumpy about how some of the people do it. And like one of these customers is like, they tossed 20 some beef out and like they're like oh they're pasture raised and like we're just gonna leave them out in this pasture and it was like an old fescue field so it's like lawn grass yeah they're like they're not growing it's like it's fescue field yeah there, there's <laughs> like, you, you can maintain them all day long but that's that's it right. it's like iceberg lettuce like yeah. you can't grow on iceberg lettuce no uh, but it's better now and I, I have to remember that not everybody comes at it from the background of guys like you and I. Yeah. Um, and that there are different ways of doing it. Doesn't make it wrong. Uh, so I get like, and their quality has definitely gone up. And I think some of that's to do with, they've started getting nicer, like feeder animals. Yeah. They're thrown out there. And some of it's to do with like the pastures are just better now too. They're getting more, more wild grass pasture mix stuff in there. Um, so everything from that to like one of my main customers that I go to runs a cow calf operation. That's got a feedlot on site and they just sell custom stuff here and there. And they're doing them either grain or grass finished and they've got everything in between. So there, I have to be a little more like flexible in what I think is right, I guess. Yeah. Um, and try to like push it all as instead of like pushing grass fed or grain finished or organic, non-organic, non-GMO, all that stuff, just pushing local, local yeah. source, direct to farmer. Like that's my I, jam. I like it. And yeah, you know, I'm not a grass fed guy. I, I don't prefer the taste. I, I think it's, it's stringy. It's tough and, and gamey. I think that's, most people are like that. Yeah, and that's me personally. But if that's your if that's your deal, like it's big money. If you can do it right, it's big money. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, we're we're all trying to get people to to eat beef, or at least in my industry. And you know, it's a better deal for for everybody involved if you can buy it local. Like if you're if the the market's shitty, like it has been for the last year on the cattle side of things, unless you're you know, like a corporate owned feedlot where you can play the margins and, and, right. and sell on the formula. Um, you're probably not making much money. You're actually probably losing money, but you can kind of cut in that by, by marketing a few of your own local. And, and then the customer gets to know 
where their 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 animal comes from, the people that are taking care of it, and the cowman gets box beef prices on his own cattle, and mm-hmm. uh, and you you don't have to go through the whole process of getting legislation passed through to to make it uh, you know stamp born raised and slaughtered in the in the u.s no you can put that there by your own choice because it is and you're and you can stand by your own product and it's you know and i get when you're running you know hundreds of or thousands of of mama cows you can't do that for all of them but you can do a little bit here and there eventually if you've got a good product you stand by it people will buy it and and it's a lot a lot of people they uh, you find out that they're getting you know the whole package of beef for about the price of a, a package of hamburger that you buy in a grocery store you know they'll like hey i may not do that this year but i'll save up and i can get one next year and uh, and then if if they like it they just come back because it's it's convenient it's easy and it's you know about a wash uh, as far as price goes or or cheaper and it's just, it's just a good good thing all the way around but right um that's I, the, the interesting thing about this area too and even the western like western oregon western washington is that we don't have like i can think of out of my customer like my rolodex of however many people I can think of two for sure, maybe three of them that ever even ship fed cow ever. Okay. Everything else is all direct to consumer. Um, and so it's interesting. Like I feel for those guys on the other side of the mountains that have all these animals and have to like be the price takers and yeah. not the price makers. Um, and I wish there was a way to help them, which they're like, this what the butcher shop sells that I work for or contract for uh, is a big uh, beef co-op. So mm-hmm. they get to make prices, but you know, there's a lot of guys still getting the short end of the stick. Yeah. So I, I guess going back to, you said you were federally inspected there for a while. Yeah. And so how much cheaper is it for you to just go with a, a state inspection versus a federal? So when I worked under federal inspection, it was actually at Oregon State University on campus okay. there. They have they have a slaughterhouse on campus, okay. which, yeah. um, you know, playing at college, a lot of them did. Uh, so I learned there and then I went up and worked on a federally inspected mobile slaughter service that in the San Juan Islands up in northwest Washington. So it okay. goes like up in those islands right next to Canada. Um and that's kind of where I got like my skill set. And then the truck that I run now is it's only custom exempt. So the difference between the two is like night and day, basically like the difference of someone raising animals in their backyard versus like a feedlot. Yeah. Um, so like under the federal inspection stuff, you have to have your grant of inspection. You have to have a HACCP plan, all these other like documents that are basically an assurance to end buyer at the grocery store, farmer's market, stuff like that, that you could like rip that package open and take a bite out of the raw product and you'd be okay. Yeah. Um, Although they say to like cook it. Whereas, so and like the animals have to like, they have to die on concrete. They have to be bled out on concrete. They can't touch dirt once they're dead. They go inside of a basically a semi-trailer to be, do all the slaughter process and it's just like a little kill floor inside the back with a cooler and it's basically just a traveling slaughterhouse whereas i'm more of just a traveling meat box all okay. the all the, the process and everything i do is outside and the elements and the dirt and whatnot so it's up to me to keep that product clean and safe for uh consumption okay so yeah yeah so i i'm uh i'm pretty big on the on the libertarian end of the spectrum uh where Mm -hmm. i think regulations a lot of them like like the left-wing stuff a lot of regulations have good intent trying to keep people safe and whatnot 
But on, on this, then say say like the the Prime Act gets enacted tomorrow, and uh, and so like your your butcher shop no longer has to be federally inspected to uh, to sell retail. You know, it just right. it's it's a free for all. You have a very strong incentive to keep that animal clean, to keep that carcass clean, to do everything the right way, so that people keep coming back or keep calling you back out there. Like, uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's not so much that you have to do it. Uh, but if you want to keep your clientele, you probably better do it. Yeah. I've done a lot of thinking on the prime act too. Cause if that passed, like that stands to make me a, a lot of money. Like, yeah. Like triple, quadruple my business overnight, um, and I'm still kind of on the fence about it. Not as like personally, like I trust myself, and I trust the people that work for me and around me. But I've seen how a lot of like custom butcher shops do business and go about that kind of thing. And I, I'm also, I would say I'm a libertarian in the things and the federally inspected one is one that I'm like, I don't want to say I'm okay with it. Cause I got a lot of issues with it, but I'm glad it's there. Um, just because I've had to work under the eyes of those guys, the FSIS, the food safety guys, mm-hmm. that are government employees, which I'll be the first one to say I've seen plenty of them reading newspapers in their office while during off working hours. Like that's its own set of things. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they have like things that they have to do Mm. um, to assure quality end product and to assure humane handling, which is a whole nother can of worms. Um, I'm glad for it. Yeah, I'm still conflicted on it. That's kind of where I'm at. Mm. Um, I think it can be done right, but I also think that it's going to get taken advantage of and people are going to get sick or die. I, I, think, hate it. I hate saying that, but... I uh, I think you're right, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of it, but I also think even with these federal ins- uh, inspections, there are people that get sick and die every year totally. due, due to it. So... I, I think that the and and every time there is like a like a beef recall from from E. coli or hell even produce as produce especially salmonella E. coli, right. uh, those companies get lit the fuck up, not just in the media but social media totally. everywhere, and they take a hit for a good while after that. And uh, I think that'll be even more pronounced like on. Like on a local level, you know how those the local Facebook groups operate. Oh like yeah, you get somebody who gets sick, or they they get like the wrong animal brought back to them. Like yeah, I see yeah. it all the time, just with custom like just custom deals, and yeah, those 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 businesses get lit the fuck up. And I, I think I think the market pressure, especially on your food, is uh, is going to be so strong that. Uh, there, there will be some people that take advantage of it, and there probably will be some people that get sick and die. But I think that will be exposed so quickly that those people will be run out of business or sued for for all they're worth. And you know, it's. Totally. I, I think there, there's probably there's going to be a definite transition period, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, people always work in their their best interest, uh, regardless of of how selfless they are. I mean, there's there's very few people that don't do something in their own self interest. So it, there's just a there's enough of a uh, you know a, of a market uh, incentive to to be clean, efficient, humane, yeah. all that that good stuff. And yeah, I, I think there could be a like a little rough patch getting going, but Main thing is, federal government makes a ton of money off of all that shit, so mm-hmm. that's why it's not going anywhere anytime soon. I, that's why yeah. I, I really don't have much faith that the Prime Act will get passed through. But 
like you said, it, uh, I, I think it'd be a huge boom to the economy, uh, especially on the like the the independent uh, producer side, because you're going to have a ton of, of local butcher shops all of a sudden not just doing custom slaughter, but actually actively trying to, to purchase their own to, to sell. So right. that's a that's price discovery at its finest is where when some guys like I I need to fill my locker, so I got to go find something. I think there could be a happy medium of it too. You know, yeah. how like with the, I don't know about what it is for other states, but Oregon, you can sell, you can have a raw milk dairy, non pasteurized, mm. um, but you can only sell on farm. Yeah. And it can only, it can only be so much per year. I'm not real familiar with it. But even if you had something like that, where it's like you have, you can sell at retail, but it's got to be on farm sales, not to like the unsus. I don't want to say unsuspecting public because I think people are entitled to make their own choices and be their do their own uh, information gathering. Yeah. But you know, you if you want to go to a farm and you can see the cows out there and say, "I want to go buy some steaks from this guy," like walk up, knock on the door, and buy some out of the freezer, and not have yeah. that be a federal offense. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's- people are people are doing it. Yeah, they just they just don't care. Exactly. <laughs> well, and I, I think there could even be a dual system, you know, where you could still have your USDA inspectors. Yeah. yeah. But like, and and say it's some like your local butcher shop that says, "Well, I'm I'm just not getting, I'm not s- spending all that money," but post it everywhere when you know, like, "Hey, this is not a USDA inspected." license or facility, whatever, and right. and I think they eventually they do it with chicken. Yeah. And and I think at the end of the day, you know, when when people see the the price difference between that, they're like, well, if I can, I'll try this, try this guy, see what he's got, and if it's good, they'll was like, well, shit, he's way cheaper, so I'm just coming back here. And like I said, and but at that well, point, yeah. the guy has the he has the financial incentives to keep up the quality of his product, and that's what that's where the market regulates it more than anything, because like, and especially in the oh, social media cool. age. Like like I said, people people will be real quick to blast out when when somebody's fucking up. Like they are they're not afraid of that, and uh, and it's that that makes a big difference. Go ahead. Yeah, go. Go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say how crazy it's been with the the shift in purchasing habits from the beginning of the pandemic till now. Oh yeah. Um, Not even till now, but like till the height from the beginning to the height of it. Uh, When this all started was like, it was like beginning of March, which is usually my cool down, get stuff fixed, take care of project season. I'll work like two or three days a week, um, like 10 to 12 hour days. And that's it. Yeah. Well, pandemic talk starts going on and the way I've been referring to it is like when you put your foot to the floor on a diesel truck, like, you know, what's about to happen and you can feel yourself going forward. But until you hit 2,500 RPM and hit that turbo, like, Mm -hmm. and then May, June, July, and all of a sudden I was booked out almost 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. People, people buying local beef. One of my ranchers that I just was like doing, I was doing six every two to three weeks for him for, uh, started coming to me and she was like, listen, I got 25 sold. When can we get them dead? Like, and just keep selling, selling more custom people going to the farmer. And I really hope that doesn't change. I, I, I don't think that, it will. Um, like the the one guy on your you had that direct to consumer podcast was talking about how when people go to the grocery store they start just buying things to eat with yeah. their pot roast or with their burger. I'm mm-hmm. hoping people get used to that and don't go back. I um, think because it's I a think cool it's, thing to see. Yeah, I, I think that's gonna keep up. I mean, I think it'll lose a, a little bit of steam once. I mean, and, and it kind of did once you saw the meat cases fill back up, right. but. Uh, I don't think that's going away. I, I don't think there's, I, I don't think that's ever fully going away. And that, like I said, that is a good thing. That's a, a, 
there's not been much good that come has come out of this whole shit show, but uh, that that's one really good thing that has, and uh, it's been it's been refreshing to see, and it, uh, it's really been cool on the producer side to see some really old school guys that have been set in their way for so long start to think, well, like, well, maybe I should sell. Like, I'm starting to get a bunch of calls for for selling some beef, and they're like, well, yep. shit, I'm making making more money than I would taking them to the sales. So I'll just hold on to them and feed them and somebody will buy them. That's the thing is like, you'll have these big feedlots uh, with nowhere to send their cattle. But I rarely ever hear of anybody having trouble getting rid of a a fed steer on the local level. I mean, I I rarely, I don't know if I've ever heard of somebody like I've got this steer that I got to get rid of. Uh, they, that was that was one of the crazier things that happened too on my end of things was that I had these customers that might have had small herds and then were selling locally and people started blowing up and they were driving to the other side of the state and the other so, so we're in Northwest Oregon and they were driving to like Central Washington because the Tyson plant closed down the IBP plant closed down. Well, Washington beef, they all closed down and were like, everybody was freaking out. So there were all these fed steers and they were just going, picking them up for next to nothing. Yeah. Um, As far as like cattle prices go, bringing them back and selling them custom and just, yeah, they were doing really good. And I wish there would have been a little more, uh, I don't want to say honesty towards the customers, but being like, hey, like we're bringing these in. Yeah. This is the price for them. That's the deal. Instead of pushing them as these are our grass fed beef or these are our locally raised. Yeah. But, you yeah, know, it, that's is, not, it is what it's it is. It's not my place to pass judgment. No, you're, you're there to get them, get them dead, get them skinned out and get totally. them to the butcher. Yeah. Well, that's totally. pretty cool. So like what, what brought you into the, this whole deal? Is that did your family do this or just you saw, saw an opening? My parents were elementary school teachers and I grew up in the city. And, uh, when I went to Oregon state, I was started in engineering and was terrible at math. (laughs) So that doesn't work out so good. No, that's kind of useful for for engineering as as math ability. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And truth be told, I'm glad I didn't go that route anyhow. So I just went, like exploratory studies and took the animal science class. And, uh, in one of the first lab sections of that class, I was like shoulder deep in a steer with a fistula. And so like reaching into the room in, yeah. and, like trying to find the feed trial sack. And I was just hooked on cattle from there yeah. and tried to get a job at the university ranch and they didn't need help. And I had no ranching skills. <laughs> so my advisor was like, they got an opening at the slaughterhouse for the cleanup kit. And I was like, I'll take it. And so I started cleaning it up after kill and cutting days. And then a year later I was running the slaughter floor and the rest I just like took off from there. Uh, people are always like, Oh, you just do slaughter all day. But I don't love the, I don't like the killing part. Like I like doing a good job with yeah. that and making sure it's humane and quick and efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, but like just the actual process of like how I go about my work and the pride I take in a clean animal and like a nice looking carcass. That's what I love. Yeah. Uh, and well, I, there's, I really, a, there's a satisfaction when you hit them, like when you hit them just right and all four legs buckle and they just boom, like totally my, my job's done. Well, and, like that, that that animal didn't suffer a bit, and, and that's, not only that, but like when you go into a herd of thirty and you got to shoot six, and you can yeah. shoot six without stirring the whole herd up or pushing them through a fence, and they are still standing there. Yeah. After that, you're like, this is about as humane as it gets. Yeah, um, for sure. They, they're just curious as to what's happening. Yeah. So those are the moments I take real pride in, like the livestock handling, and like I can do this job and have these other animals around and nobody freaked out like no idea yeah well and and that's you know this one thing i've never i don't think i've ever brought up on the podcast before and that i kind of 
kicking myself for it now, but I, I know there's some some folks out there that listen that I've never heard that like how you handle the cattle cattle or lamb, pig, whatever, how you handle it has a direct correlation to how or what the quality of the meat is. So hundred percent. And even in these big packing plants. Uh, the guys that are are just ramming and jamming and just shoving a hot shot everywhere, like those guys don't last very long because those lead to dark cutters. So when when you have uh, an excited animal, agitated animal, it uh, creates a buildup of lactic acid in the muscle, and you get like the dark purple, like game meat color on beef, and you don't want that unless right. you're unless you're doing a grass fed because that's a, the natural color. It's a uh, it's a well, darker. The pH doesn't drop during the rigor mortis process <clears throat> properly, and yeah. so they, they end up not being able to hold water when you cook yeah. it. Yeah, um, so it's a dark, dry cut of meat, and and it's just yep. tough. So the so, so all those people that they get the the idea that we're just like bloodthirsty animals getting them to to kill. Like that's, it's not the case at all. You you want them to move quickly and efficiently, but you want them. S- Quiet. You know, you don't Slower want them. Is faster. Exactly. That that's uh it's an old saying and, and it rings true all the time. Like if you just step back, relax, and slow down a little bit, your cattle move more efficiently, not faster, but the overall process is faster because they're moving efficiently. So yeah, instead you of give them time to let them think. Yeah. So instead of trying to jam 30 of them through the gate at, at one time and it taking 10 minutes. You can back up and let five of them through the gate at one time, and you can go five of them 30 seconds at a time, and you're right. there for three minutes instead of 10. And and so it it's not, you're not doing anything to make them go faster except slowing, slowing down yourself. And and that, that has a, a direct impact on the quality of the meat. And so that's so like even like you can you can get really good beef at the grocery store. Most of your beef at the grocery store, I don't care if it's American beef or, or imported beef, it's good beef because it's been inspected hundreds of times. And uh, and so like th- those kill even the big kill plants, they stress animal handling because it relates to their bottom line. Okay, so that totally. goes back to the whole the market incentive. There's an incentive for them to be humane because it pre- yeah. produces a better carcass, which brings a better price and uh, and a happier customer. That's also one thing I think I wish I've always been a proponent of big agriculture and big livestock too. Yeah, because that's what I grew up on. Like we didn't buy fancy bougie local beef when i was a kid like we went to the the it wasn't walmart but same idea in my neighborhood um and that's what i grew up on and like grew on so Mm -hmm. those guys have a place in the industry just as much as the local board types um and whether you think it's because they need feel like they need to do it the right way or because of regulation government oversight or just because they're trying to watch their bottom line and maximize profits. If an animal is not stressed out through the process, what's it matter? Um, yeah. Yeah. Who gives a shit? They have huge incentive in like the fines and all the relations that come with federal inspection for inhumane handling. The U S government is really good at putting inhumane slaughter practices on blast publicly. They post a, a dossier every every so often that lists the plant name, the offense, and like a detailed account of the fence to the public. Yeah. So yeah, you got good reason to not screw up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so and it's also uh, a better reason to not take these PETA videos seriously because totally they will cherry pick like literally months of footage and splice different scenarios together to to make one clip to make it look as bad as possible. Just assume that people just assume this is all happening in the States. 
<clears throat> when I've seen the, a lot of them and it's like, that's not in the U S like that's not, I know that's not in the U S yeah. You know? We've got no control over that. No. And you know, and PETA for, for all their faults and like, it's basically all faults that they have. They're very good at getting their message out. I mean, <clears throat> totally. You can't take that away from them. They're, they are good at it. Uh, but I think, I think there's enough word out there now that hey, Peta Peta's full of shit. Which and that that's that's one thing that we can do more of on uh, on the agriculture land instead of just getting up in arms about the the latest video that that makes somebody look bad. Uh, you can go right to what Peta does, and very little of it is helping animals, and and that's all public knowledge. So rather than attacking. The, the video attack them themselves like their actual practices and uh and then when you get into that it doesn't make uh that the video of a, of a poor mexican guy kicking a holstein cap in the head because he won't suck a damn bottle even though he's been trying for two and a half fucking hours um you get a little pissed off when that happens you're, you're trying to save this damn thing and he is actively fighting you to die right. and uh and and it's uh, you know it it shouldn't happen. Not condoning it, but I've been in that scenario. I've done. I've been the guy in that video. There, there's no context behind it, but you don't have. You don't even have to stand up for that guy. You can just say, "Hey, that's you know that shouldn't happen." Right. I understand it. It shouldn't happen. But this this organization that's putting out this video. Look how much money they actually spend helping animals. No, they'll pay Joaquin Phoenix, you know, a million dollars to make a video looking like a fish drowning. Uh, but how many animals do they save? Zero. Right. And and you, you, can, you can point out that was, stuff. Was not even a, a PETA thing. I was going to bring this up earlier. Was when they uh, was the ABC went after. Was it IBP uh, for uh, the pink slime? Yeah, it was uh, BPI. Beef product BPI. Lean. I worked for BPI. I interned for him one summer. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I was the master of the pink slime for about three months. I think that's awesome <clears throat> because I. I mean, it sucks that, like, truthfully, it sucks that they're not even using it anymore because people don't realize that to like make up that deficit in ground beef. Like yeah, more more animals are having to be butchered. You know, and that that's a, another deal is uh, that led to directly led to the importation of beef too. Yep. Uh, yep. Because the BPI had this process. So for all those una, unaware, uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll end on this little little note. Uh, but so BPI is Beef Products International. They're out of I think Sioux Falls, Iowa. Mm -hmm. and and mostly they they were their own little section on like all your major packing plants bpi had a little section just off to the side and all they did was they they took in excess fat and and trimmings uh lean trimmings from and they took them in from everywhere i know i was at the the tyson uh in holcomb kansas uh so that's uh about a six thousand a head six thousand head a day slaughter plant BPI took in trimmings from the Tyson there. Took it. Took trimmings from Tyson and Amarillo. They took uh, Dodge City, different couple different plants. They, I mean, they took in trimmings from everywhere. They mixed it with their percentage of fat, and they partially cooked it, made it into these little pellets, flash froze it, and that got mixed in with uh, with regular hamburger for different restaurants. So. At one point, 80% of the ground beef in the U.S. contained this stuff. They called pink slime because that's kind of what it looked like coming out of the tubes into where it got flash frozen. And then they either made it. FTB. Yep. Fine, lean, leanly, uh, fine, finely textured lean beef or something like that. Yep. yep. Lean, finely textured beef. That's what it is. Um, and so it was either in a pellet or like a... Uh, Oh, um, like a check cereal type square, depending on who on the customer. I I signed an NDA at one point. I, whatever. <laughs> I, I don't even know if they're in business, but 
<laughs> Anyhow, um, and they they would blast it with ammonia to kill E. coli, and uh, and like, but I was I was quality assurance as an intern, so like I, I had eight or nine different stations I had to check every hour, and then like two or three stations that I had to check uh, like a couple times per shift. And so you had to, you had to check the line of the of the beef coming in and check for the the quality of the meat. You had to check the temperature of the floor. You had to check the temperature of the product. You had to check the level of the fat versus the lean, the tallow versus the the lean. There was a bunch of different stuff you had to check, and it was all it's all fine and good. Like they they had it down to a science. They had it down to assembly line efficiency. And uh, and there was this story that came out, and they called it pink slime because that's what a USDA inspector called it because that's kind of what it looked like. It looked like hamburger, but not really because it was really lean. There was very little fat to it, and they used that to take uh, like a seventy five twenty five mix of hamburger up to like a ninety ten. And so you just you would blend it just to just to make your your percentages how you wanted it. That that was all it was. And it dropped the temp of uh, like big commercial grinds, yeah. which was always a good thing for the, the packing house too. Yeah, exactly. Because it's frozen. Mm-hmm. And um, but yeah, because of that, they got slandered in the media for what, like two months straight, something like that. Because people thought they were spraying it with Windex. No, it was it was uh, commercial grade ammonia, and it was at right. acceptable. Like, as soon as that ammonia level got above what was accepted. There was a alarm that went off through the whole plant. They could hear it on the right. Tyson side of the plant and like everything shut down. Like you did not put right. excess ammonia into the beef. Like, like it was a big deal right. when that alarm right. went off. I mean, you saw people scurrying to, to get shit done. And, uh, right. but they, they got, they got drugged through the mud because that's what the, the fucking media does. And, uh, they laid off like something like 120 people at that plant. It was after, I mean, that, that all came out after I was there, but like they shut down the, that operation there at the, at the Tyson plant. And that was like 100, 120 people that, that worked there full time just out of a job. And, uh, well, and the impact on excess, the deficit yeah. for all that stuff that was not having to be slaughtered because it was being utilized. <laughs> Now, where's that going to come from? You yeah, know? exactly. So they had to import a bunch of beef because the way we feed cattle here, we feed them to marble and uh, and to be fatty. That's how that's how we do it because it's, it tastes better. I mean, it, whatever. If you're a grass beef guy, sorry, whatever. I, it just that's that's what people want, and uh, because of that, we have an excess of fat. Uh, that, that can be used for different things, but the most profitable way is to put it back into lean cuts of, of meat, grind it, make hamburger, because hamburger sells all the time. All the time. Like, you, you have you have a harder time selling a ribeye than you do 20 pounds of hamburger. And um, so, to make up that difference, rather than make it into soap or something, they, we import a bunch of beef from Brazil, Argentina. Mambia, wherever, and we mix it with U.S. fat, and uh, and it gets labeled as product of the U.S., which is a little sketchy. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it. Uh, I don't, but I also don't agree with the whole, the mandatory labeling deal either. I, that's a, that's a weird issue. I, I I see both ends of it. I don't know if it makes that big of a difference, to be honest. But well, like uh, you said, there's always going to be ways around it. Oh, and there. Leave every it to time. the federal government to screw up a good thing. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> and if they're going to Im- implement something, uh, guarantee you, uh, those big four Packers are going to come knocking on a couple different senators and congressmen's door and like, hey, yeah. Even if you have to pass this, you better put something in to where we can uh, weasel our way out- around it. That's how that's how crony Definitely. capitalism works, fellas. But um, and hey, that's a, that's a, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, we'll uh, we'll get back on uh, another day and talk about the you know about how all that shit uh, trickles downstream and and whatnot. But that 
That's a, it's been a fascinating uh, conversation there, Andrew. Uh, do you call it, you get called Andrew, Andy, whatever. Whatever. Just don't call what? me late for dinner. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. Uh, so you, have, you've been at it for like 10 years now? Something like, yeah, coming up on 11. Nice. Yeah, all, I mean, in the industry. But yeah, running this business for seven. Hell so. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's a cool deal. Is a uh, city kid gets to, gets to work with cows nowadays, and, and it it was the dream. And I'm you know kind of there. We'll get there yeah. full all the way someday. Yeah, one of these days you'll have your own cattle marketing your own beef, and you'll be able to butcher them for people. That's the idea. That's the there goal. There you go. There you go. American dream, baby. That's right. Hell yeah. Well. Man, I appreciate the shit out of you coming on. And uh, if uh, where where can everybody find you on on? Uh, I guess you're on, you're on Instagram only. Yeah, that's pretty much it. At Farm Butcher, I don't post a whole lot, and I post a lot of random shit. So. <laughs> uh, pretty informative videos, though. I I like it. I I really liked seeing the your winch set up, just peeling a hog. Uh, no oh, no yeah. biggie. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you if you're if you're into seeing where where your your meat comes from and how how it gets to your plate, um, he's a good one to go look and and it's just interesting. So uh, at Farm Butcher on Instagram, uh, you guys know where to find me, Matt McKinley, Facebook, uh, at Maker Mac eighty five on the rest of them. Uh, move your ass for the the show page uh, and Burning Daylight on Facebook and uh, YouTube, but. I think that's going to do it for us. So you'll have a wonderful week. Night. And uh, Andrew, thanks for coming on. Let and we'll be asking for burning daylight. Proudly crawled to the porch and called. Your favorite child is here. And Ma asks where you're living. And are you living right within? She said with fire. Gospel choir, a saint immune to sin. Old Irene, like a raven bum, she's cutting every rug and killing every jug. She comes up on old Irene, never lacking charm. Pouring visine into her eyes to see her trembling hand was to understand Some things you can't disguise All said not for nothing But you don't seem to be quite well Sometimes I wake up feeling dead And if the sun should shine I close my blinds Pretend there's rain still I took down all my mirrors I gave away all my rope and guns Drowned the dark